Welcome ladies and gentlemen to part two of episode 10. In today's episode we're going to be looking at the hammer and whether the hammer could have inflicted the wounds and fractures on Inga's head. Please note that in this video I will be showing photos of some of Inga's head wounds. Sensitive viewers or people that may find this upsetting are strongly advised not to watch this video. So we know from the previous episode that Sergeant Peter Davids tested the hammer of luminol and found possible blood on the hammer. After C have done the test, the hammer was taken by Bartholomew to the, forens to the Forensic Science Laboratory's ballistic unit and he specifically requested them to see whether the diameter of the hammer was consistent with the wounds inflicted on Inga's head and if it was the same type of hammer that had been used to commit the offence. Now before we proceed, we need to understand why the hammer was considered an important piece of evidence. Now Bartholomew was present at the autopsy and some of the autopsy photos were actually taken by him. Now during the autopsy, the coroner, Dr. Ansi Adendorf, told the police to look for a hammer. So there are two distinct types of wounds in Inga's scalp. Even to an untrained eye, we have these round wounds, which are ones that made Adenov think of a hammer, and these linear wounds. And they were obviously made by the striking uh, surfaces that had different shapes. Now this is a photo of the wounds on the right side of Inga's head. Now this photo became quite controversial and I will talk about this later. When Fred's hammer was found, they found an object with a round striking surface that could have made the round wounds, with a bottle opener part which could possibly have made the linear wounds. And then the suspicions became stronger after blood was found on the hammer, or possible blood was found on the hammer. It would have been an easy task to rotate the hammer in his hands between blows. Some could have been delivered in the front hand fashion to the right side of the head and some in the back hand fashion to the left side of the head. Now the investigation was assigned to Captain Franz Maritz, a highly qualified firearms and tool marks examiner. He graduated first out of 400 trainees from the SAPS Academy. He holds a US equivalent of a Bachelor of Science degree with multiple distinctions an associate degree in forensic criminalistics with forensic ballistics as a major and a diploma in police management. So on May the 17th, 2005, Moritz received the hammer as well as a replica of the kitchen knife that was suspected and as well as a file containing various crime scene and autopsy photos. And the next day they faxed to him a copy of the autopsy report. And then he started his investigation to find out whether the marks made by the ornamental hammer put the wounds on Inga's head. On May the 19th, 2005, under the guidance of forensic pathologist Dr. Denise Lawrence, with the assistance of Captain Yanni Bester, Moritz conducted tests on pig's heads at the Tigerberg Medical Legal Department. Bartholomew videotaped the test and Cock took notes. Bester administered the blows and after each blow Bartholomew would photograph the results while Cock measured the sizes with digital calipers. It was during these tests that the edge of the bottle opener end of the ornamental hammer bent. Whoa. The judge considered this a serious problem. Though under circumstances it would have been unusual for a hammer not to bend. It should, have, it should not have come as a surprise and should certainly not have been seen as a problem. The bending of the hammer is absolutely not relevant in any way whatsoever as to whether this hammer could have been used to inflict the wounds on Inga's head. A pig's head on a belt tight on a steel table with little room for movement is not comparable with Inga's head resting on a soft armrest that could swivel from side to side. The forces acting on the bottle opener part of the hammer would have been much less when hitting Inga's head than hitting a pig's head. 
according to Newton's law of physics, the forces acting on the hammer would have been inversely proportional to the distance the hammer has to travel to a speed of zero after impact. The smaller the distance, the larger the force. The bigger the distance, the smaller the force. Obviously, Inge's head had the greater ability to move and yield to uh, compare with a pig's head. Now, Inge's head was resting on a soft armrest, and it could also swivel from side to side. Therefore, it goes without saying, because of this ability to yield and move, Inge's head would have offered much less resistance to the pig's head, and the strain on the hammer would have been much less. Then, of course, the judge accused Moritz of not putting this in his report and made out as if Moritz was dishonestly trying to hide this. But this just shows how inexperienced the judge was with dealing with criminal cases, something that even Klatsau admitted to. And particularly inexperienced in dealing with Section 212 affidavits. We know that the judge accepted Roger Dixon's Section 212 affidavit, even though it was nowhere near compliant with the requirements of Section 212 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Now, Section 212 affidavits are typically completed by hand on a template form, which is then given to a typist to type up before the officer signs it in the presence of a commissioner of oaths. Section 212 affidavits follow very basic outline. First, there's the personal information and qualifications, how they receive the evidence from who, when, what are the serial numbers, what methodology did they follow, what were the results, and how did they return the evidence just so that they could keep a chain of custody. Now, here's an example of a section 212 affidavit used by a geologist to identify abalone. And you can see it's, it's basically a template form and you just fill in the gaps. And that's exactly what Moretz did. So not putting something in a 212 affidavit is certainly not an attempt to hide it. Everything that Moretz did was documented and placed in the docket. Nothing was hidden. The defense had everything in the docket, including the video, as this was provided to the defense in April 2006 a whole 10 months before the start of the trial. So by the time the trial came, they already knew about the bending of the hammer. The defense had every opportunity to during cross-examination to bring forward information in the docket they deem, that they may deem relevant to their argument or that may not be in a section 212 affidavit or in a report. And that is what the defense did in this case. They had advanced information about the bending of the hammer and they brought it up during cross-examination. That is how the system works. Why also didn't Maritz speak of the bending of the hammer during his evidence in chief? The answer to that is simple. The state simply did not ask him about it. And when you're a witness, you are expected to answer the questions put to you as succinctly and as efficiently as possible. You don't elaborate unless asked to, and you don't volunteer information that's not directly related to the question you've been asked. So before repairing the suspect hammer, fearing that it might break in the process, Moritz obtained an additional, marginally larger ornamental hammer. It was uh, very difficult for him to find this, and he visited every gift store between Cape Town and Somerset West, and one day, he was in a gift store and a customer overheard him looking for a hammer and she by chance had a hammer and she agreed that Maritz could borrow the hammer from her. Her contact details and everything about her and how this hammer was obtained was all documented and it was in the docket. Now the widest part of the bottle opener of the additional hammer is about 1.45 millimeter wider than the suspect hammer and the diameter is only about 0.3 millimeters wider and it weighs about six grams more. They both have the same length 
and then in all respects they are very similar and comparable to one another so after obtaining the additional hammer Maritz took a chance and he tried to bend the bottle opener part back in shape and he was successful so he continued to use the suspect hammer in the test that followed thereafter he used the round striking surface to make test impressions on a lead sheet he used the opener part to make test impressions in clay he also made a model of a human ear and did test in that as well as one of the blows in Inga's head slides into a part of her ear Maritz also conducted a test on sheep's heads with both the suspect hammer and the additional hammer now sheep heads were used because sheep and goat skins are generally regarded as more similar to human skin and all these tests were photographed in Bruce Bartholomew and the photos are in the docket. Moretz also received one-to-one -one scale black and white photographs of all Inga's wounds from the Western Cape uh, local criminal record center and he overlaid transparencies of the hammer's head on top of the photographs to assess how well it fitted the settler wounds on Inga's head. Uh, he then compiled a section 212 affidavit and a report and copies of these were given to the defense. Now in essence Morris concluded that the class characteristics of the round semicircular wounds on Inga's head were consistent to the marks made by the round striking surface of the suspect hammer on the lead plate in the sheep's head. And here we can see a comparison of the wounds on Inga's head to the marks made by the suspect hammer on the lead, on the lead plate. And you can see the similarities are obvious and undeniable. Secondly, the class characteristics of the linear wounds on Inga's head were consistent to the marks made by the bottle opener side of the suspect hammer that was made on the clay plate and the sheep's head. And here is a comparison on some of the linear marks to the marks made on clay. It's not a very good comparison, but you have to keep in mind that clay doesn't have this, exactly the same characteristics and elasticity as skin. And that's also why these tests were repeated on pig and sheep's heads. And then he also concluded that the diameter of the suspect hammer is the same as the diameter of the round semicircular wounds on Inga's head. And here is a scaled overlay made by Thomas. And it's clear that these, these sizes are basically a perfect fit. The width of the bottle opener side is also very consistent with the width of the linear wound on Inga's head. And here are some overlays made by Thomas. Now, Maritz included close to 100 scaled photos of his test and results, as well as photos of the actual wounds and weapons in his report and case file. He also included the video of the test on the pig's heads, which was done in, on the 19th of May 2005. So all of this was in docket, all of this was made available to the defense 10, month, 10 months before the start of the trial. Now it is clear that Maritz did a very thorough and a very detailed investigation. He took a st strong scientific approach to his investigation. But he was nonetheless severely criticized and vilified by the fact that he did not mention in his affidavit or his report that he used a second hammer in some of his tests. Now let us be clear about a few things. So after the bending of the bottle opener part of the hammer, the second hammer did not replace the suspect hammer. It was used in addition to because it was so similar and comparable. The marks on the clay and the lead plates were made by the suspect hammer. The suspect hammer was also used in addition to the second hammer on the sheep heads, and Maritz could have arrived at these conclusions about the comparison of the class characteristics solely on the basis of the test conducted with the suspect hammer. Now Maritz knew he would not be able to state with 100% certainty that Fred's hammer was used. There are no distinguishing features that would make for 
100% conclusive evidence that the hammer was used. The best thing we could do was to determine if a hammer like Fred's could have made the wounds and fractures. To that end, it would be appropriate to use another similar hammer for the purpose of, of investigating the class characteristics of that type of hammer. He did not use the second hammer to make a claim that Fred's hammer was 100% the hammer that was used in a murder. That would not have been appropriate. He simply said a hammer like that, an ornamental hammer like the one that was found in Fred's vehicle. Now the second hammer wasn't mentioned in the section 212 affidavit because it was not evidence. It was just a reference object. And for that reason, when Moritz came to court, he brought the hammer with him in his briefcase. He declared it at security and the prosecutors knew he had the hammer with him. And the first opportunity that the defense asked him about this hammer, he pulled the hammer out and he produced it. And that hammer was then entered as exhibit number 23 in the court. Was this the actions of someone that was trying to hide the fact that the second hammer was used after the first hammer bent? And this is exactly what the judge thought he did. This is what he said. It was also not mentioned that for fear that the bent part of the hammer would break off, if applied further, we went to great lengths to obtain a similar hammer. Further tests were then done with the substitute hammer, despite the fact that the measurements thereof in some areas were significantly between 37 and 49% larger than the ornamental hammer. None of this is apparent from the report. Now, I have a few comments on what the judge said. Firstly, the second hammer was not the substitute hammer. It did not replace the suspect hammer. It was used in addition to. When Moritz managed to repair Fred's hammer, he decided to continue using it. Secondly, it should be noted that these high percentage differences only relate to non-critical, unimportant dimensions related to the bottle opener part of the hammer. Now to investigate the class characteristics of the wounds, the important dimensions are the diameter of the striking surface and the width of the bottle opener part of the hammer. And these were also the only dimensions what could obtain from the head wound photos. It would not have been useful to try and measure the width of the linear wounds because after splitting, the, el the elasticity of the skin may have caused the, the, the wound to become wider and more open. And that would have not have been useful. So under critical parameters, the width of the bottle opener part, the diameter of the striking surface, these hammers are almost identical, only very marginally different. And these dimensions that were between 37 and 49 percent different had absolutely nothing to do with the classical characteristics of the shape on Inga's head. Then the judge later said, the test that Captain Maritz performed with the transparencies appeared persuasive, but patently failed to conform to the scientific exactness required for the accuracy of such a test, as correctly pointed out by Professor Simon. In addition, his experiments with the hammer, which was later replaced with a similar hammer, were completely unreliable. In my view, it borders on unprofessional that in his sworn affidavit he did not mention a word about the bending of the bottle opener part of the ornamental hammer and his subsequent replacing of it with a similar hammer. This omission, in fact, tainted his testimony as a whole. Again, the judge is not correct in saying that the hammer was replaced. He keeps going on about the replacement of the hammer. He's wrong. He made a mistake if this is what he thought. As mentioned before, in section 212, affidavit is a very concise document whose primary purpose is to present the results of your test. If you want to know more about the test, you can consult the case docket. It has its notes 
photos, sketches, videos, etc. Now it's very disconcerting that Maritz's excellent work in testimony was considered tainted simply because he diligently followed process and protocol as we expect of our police to do. So where are we now with how the circumstantial evidence stack up? A hammer with unexplained possible blood on, whose striking surfaces could have made the wounds on Inga's head and who could have made the fractures of Inga's skull, was found in the vehicle of someone who argued with the victim on the day of the murder and whose fingerprint places him at the crime scene and who lied about his movement to the police and his mother in a period leading up to the discovery of the body. Can you see how with each additional piece of circumstantial evidence, the news just gets tighter and tighter? Now, Maritza's very comprehensive and detailed study must have caused the defense some sleepless nights, much like a fingerprint on Folion 1 did. Now, when you have your back against a wall like this, one of the most common strategies is to cast doubt on the honesty and integrity of the state witness, in this case, in this case Captain Maritz. And the defense skillfully used the issue about the bending of the hammer and the use of an additional hammer to manipulate the judge in making him believe that Maritz was dishonestly trying to hide it. And secondly, the defense had to find a counter to Maritz to Maritz's very incriminating comparison of the class characteristics and a one-to-one -one overlay exercise. Now, it's hard to imagine the defense would have been able to counter this, but alas, they did. They did manage to convince a judge that the hammer was too small to have made the wounds and fractures on Inga's skull. Now, for this, Fred owes an enormous amount of gratitude to the coroner, Dr. Ansi Audendorf. And unknowingly, she gave the defense exactly what they needed, incorrect measurements in the autopsy report. In her autopsy report, she said that these two wounds were 30 millimeters long. In this image, the big circles have a dimension of 30 millimeters and the small circles about 20 millimeters, the diameter of the round striking surface of the hammer. The enormity of Dr. Ardendorf's mistakes is clearly evident. The defense acknowledged that on this photo, wounds A and B do scale to about 20 to 22 millimeters. However, they claim that in reality, these wounds are actually 30 millimeters in size and that they just appear smaller in this photo because the photo was taken at an angle. Now, it's true that this photo was not taken 90 degrees from above, but from a marginal angle from the perpendicular. Now the question is, can such a photo angle distort a 30 millimeter wound to measure 20 millimeters on this photograph? Now here we have a circle looking at it directly from the top, 30 millimeters from diameter. Now what happens when we look at it from an angle? So the circle turned into ellipse, but what's important to notice is that the long side of the ellipse will always remain the same as the diameter of the original circle. It doesn't matter from which angle and orientation you look at it. So it's impossible to reduce a 30 millimeter diameter circle into something that measures as a circle with a 20 millimeter diameter. And when you look at this photo, these two wounds are still circular. They are not ellipses. So they, the photo angle were not that great. They returned these two circles into ellipses. So who is the defense expert that convinced the court that Maritz's one-to-one -one overlays were unscientific because the parallax error distorted an actual 30 millimeter wound to appear to be only 20 millimeters big on this photo? It is none other than Professor Johan Simon. Now, Professor Simon, as an impressive resume, and the court held his credentials in very high regard. At the time he testified in the Inga Lodge case, he had about 24 years experience and had performed and supervised up to 20,000 autopsies. Professor Simon also performed an autopsy in Riverstienka 
and we know that he missed a wound on Reva's body that may have been caused by a pellet gun, uh, which he did not mention in his autopsy report. You can read more about that in our book, Oscar vs. The Truth, which you can find at knowledgemedia.com. Now, the following conversation transpired between Professor Simon and Advocate Tennyson. Simon. We have here a skew camera angle at which the photo was taken. Can I ask, uh, maybe someone can tell me what the length of the wound was as described by Dr. Ardendorf in a report? I unfortunately don't have a copy of the autopsy report with me. Tennyson. Your Honor, I think it was 30 millimeters long. Simon. Then the answer is clearly evident. You have just said it. If that wound was 30 millimeters, then it is totally possible that the shape of the hammer can fit on the wound precisely. There is almost 50% difference in the measurements, because the hammer is 20 millimeters in diameter. Tennyson. Professor, that is if we accept that Dr. Arendorf's measurements were absolutely correct. Simon. Pardon, Your Honor. I accepted it was. Of course, if he had to choose between Arendorf's mistaken measurements or the scaled photograph, he, he would choose Arendorf's measurements because that would be most advantageous to his paying client. Now, Simon presented no analysis of any kind to substantiate his claim that the one-to-one -one transparency exercise would result in a 10 millimeter error because of the photo angle. Now, Thomas have consulted with other forensic experts on these wounds, and this is what they said. Dr. Leon Wagner, a forensic pathologist from Bloemfontein, after studying the autopsy report and the photos concluded, the measurements of wounds marked as 1A and 1B can clearly not be 30 millimeters, and these measurements are clearly incorrect. These measurements are rather closer to 20 millimeters. The angle of incidence of the relevant photo is irrelevant because if this was the case, all measurements would have shown the same degree of deviation and not selectively. Now, Professor Teron from the University of Pretoria, a professor in physics, using the perspective of the ruler, calculated the angles of the photo and he used these then to determine the actual dimensions of the wounds after allowing for possible distortion. And his conclusion was, the dimensions of the wounds are consistent with an object that has a striking surface of two centimeters in diameter and not a three centimeter object. But let's look at some of the stuff that Simon came up with that the judge was so impressed with. But before we go there, let's look again at the wounds on Inga's head. There were two types, the round bean shaped wounds and the linear shapes. Now Moritz claimed in his report that the round bean shaped wounds were made by the round striking surface of the hammer and the linear wounds by the bottle opener side of the hammer. Not only is this obvious to the uneducated mind, but Moritz also confirmed it by means of the test he did with the suspect hammer on lead, plates, clay, sheep's head, pig's head. I simply cannot believe that it would not have been obvious to Professor Simon as well. Now, Professor Simon prepared a PowerPoint presentation which he presented to court. The problem was that the state was not provided with an advanced copy of this presentation before Simon's testimony. And therefore they had no idea what Simon would be testifying about, giving the state little to no opportunity prepare a competent cross-examination. So just before the onset of the state's cross-examination, one of the prosecutors told the judge that, Simon's, that Simon delivered testimony that was never put to Dr. Ardendorf or Captain Moritz, and that the state may at a later time submit an application to reopen the case to bring in a pathologist as a rebuttal witness. The defense indicated to the court that they will vehemently oppose such an application for the state to bring in another pathologist to rebut Dr. Simon's testimony. So we see here a great imbalance in our justice system in that the state at all times have to disclose every bit of information they have 
to the defense, whereas the defense is under no obligation to do the same, especially when it comes to expert witness reports. I guess that's because the onus is on the state to prove guilt, to, to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt, whereas the defense doesn't have to prove anything. In my opinion, it's unreasonable to expect of state prosecutors to, in the time that they have, available after the defense witness testified to consult with the relevant experts in the fields in order to prepare a good cross-examination. And courts are unlikely to provide long adjournments in order for the state to get ready. Now, unfortunately, the state wasn't sufficiently prepared to expose Simon. And they also did not reopen the case to bring in the pathologist to challenge Simon and to provide a more honest perspective on the pathology in this case. So this is, a, this is from slide three in Simon's PowerPoint presentation. Now this is the same photo that Simon said was not suitable to be used for measurements because it was taken at an angle. And yet he had no problem doing his own measurements from this photo. So how did he measure? He drew in PowerPoint these arrows. And when you look at it close up, they are incredibly imprecise. And then he copied and rotated these arrows onto the ruler. So in this photo, he copied only the blue and the red arrows onto the ruler, and then said that the dimension is visibly larger than the striking surface of the hammer. Now the thing is, these wounds with the blue and the red arrows are linear wounds that would have been made by the bottle opener part of the hammer, not the round striking surface. But to mislead the court, he claims the diameter measurement is obviously bigger than the diameter of the striking surface of the suspect hammer. He compared the sizes of these wounds to the dimensions of the round striking surface of the hammer, whereas no one claimed that they were at all caused by the round striking surface. surface. Here's another example. These two wounds would have been made by the round striking surface of the hammer. That's pretty obvious. But what does Simon say about them? The regular edges and the bruising would not be made by the bottle opener part of the hammer. And that's not all, ladies and gentlemen. There is more. Again, this is a linear wound that would have been made by the bottle opener part of the hammer. And yet Simon said that the laceration is not consistent with the round surface of the hammer. So in the rest of his presentation, he put in some pictures from a pathology textbook to show what wounds made by a variety of objects look like, like a flashlight or a metal pipe. And there was only one photo of a skull fracture made by a hammer, a, a round hole punched in, into the skull, similar to what was found on Inga's forehead, yet he failed to make the comparison. Just interestingly, the hole punched in Inga's forehead was a neatly circular with a diameter of about 20 millimeters. The pictures produced by Simon were all from a well-known pathology textbook, Knight's Forensic Pathology, by Pekka Sarko and Bernard Knight. Although the book does not have photos of hammer blows to a scalp, it does provide a description of what you expect. Sometimes the shape is recognizable, and probably the best example is a hammer blow to the head. A circular face may punch out a circle or an arc of a circle, which may also be produced in an underlying depressed skull fracture. The exact size of the hammer face may not be accurately reproduced in the laceration, which may be slightly larger than a hammer. And then they also said, lacerations of the scalp may reproduce the pattern of the inflicting object, even though random splitting is also common. Severe blows from shaped objects, such as hammers or heavy tools, may reproduce the profile of the weapon totally or in part. A circular face hammer may punch a circle in the scalp but more often only an arc of a circle is seen. In such cases, the position of the edge that digs in most deeply may give an indication of the angle of the blow. And that is exactly what's described as seen in this photo. The hammer did not make perpendicular impact, but at somewhat of an angle, as one would expect from a right-handed right -handed person delivering blows to the right side of the head while standing slightly to the left. This here is what Moritz produced on a lead plate. And here we can see one of Inga's head wounds. And we can compare this with what was described in Knight's textbook. 
a circular face may punch out a circle or an arc of a circle. So these series of blows cause a large comminuted skull fracture of about 7 cm diameter. Simon used this to argue that the hammer blows would have left individual skull fractures and that such a large skull fracture was caused by a much larger and heavier object. He made no allowances for the combined effect of these hammer blows over such a small area. And according to Lietzma and Ellen Bogen, repeated hammer blows can cause such large comminuted fractures. So now let's compare Maritz and Simon. So Maritz had the actual hammer and with this hammer he performed a number of tests on pig's heads, sheep head, lead plates and clay to study the shape of the wounds made by the two sides of the hammer. He also did the one-to-one -one overlays to show that the diameter of the round striking surface of the hammer was a perfect fit to the round circular wounds found on Inga's head. And throughout this, he documented his methodology and his results in the case docket. There were notes, photos, and videos, etc. Now, what did Simon do? Nothing. Nothing other than looking at the autopsy photos and copying photos from a textbook. He measured these wounds using arrows in PowerPoint and not very accurately. He did no test. He relied on his experience. But how many bodies have he performed an autopsy on that was attacked by the bottle opening part of an ornamental hammer? He took measurements from a photo he told the court was unsuitable to take measurements from because it was taken at an angle. He defended Dr. Ardendorf's convenient error by advocating the parallax error theory, which had no scientific merit and he, as an educated and an experienced professor, professional, must have known that it had no merit. And what did the judge think of Simon? This is what the judge said. The testimony of Professor Simon, who in all respects honored his reputation as a leading expert in his field, was, in my view, clear and scientifically well-founded. Clear and scientifically well-founded. The judge also said, when this testimony is taken into consideration, the unavoidable conclusion must be reached that Captain Maritz did not advance the state's case in a material way. His ultimate conclusion, namely that he could not exclude beyond reasonable doubt the hammer as a possible murder weapon, falls significantly short of the burden that rests on the state to show that it was indeed beyond reasonable doubt used as the murder weapon. That the judge thought that the state had to, or intended to prove, that the hammer was the middle weapon beyond reasonable doubt is very disconcerting. It, it just shows that the judge did not understand the role of circumstantial evidence. The state never offered the hammer as direct evidence, only as circumstantial evidence. Again, take note of Captain Marissa's conclusion that the murder could have been committed with French hammer or a similar hammer. And I've shown this before and I will show it again. The court must guard against a tendency to focus too intently upon the separate and individual part of what is, after all, a mosaic of proof. Doubts about one aspect of the evidence let in the trial may arise when that aspect is viewed in isolation. The doubts may be set arrest when it is evaluated again together with all other available evidence. It is necessary to step back a pace and consider the mosaic as a whole. If that is not done, one may fail to see the wood for the trees. Therefore, when considering circumstantial evidence, the court does not have to reject evidence just because it could not be proven beyond reasonable doubt. Circumstantial evidence does not need to meet this threshold. It can still stay on the scale even though it, there is still some uncertainty about it so they could be weighed with all the other circumstantial evidence. Lastly, we know that the towel was found on the bathroom floor, and on this towel, there were blood and loose strands of hair. The presence of hair seemed to indicate that the towel was used at some stage to hold and or to clean the murder weapon. Now, the current whereabouts of the towel is unknown. It has probably been destroyed. Uh, 
because of the incriminating evidence that it would reveal. Private investigator Pitt Bale, during his investigation of the Lodge case, discovered that the towel went missing after it was stolen from the judge's chambers. Now, what the towel was doing in the judge's chamber is a mystery. Fortunately, we had access to a number of photos taken of the towel, and after conducting a detailed study of these photos, Thomas made some startling discoveries, imprints of the hammer on the towel. Ladies and gentlemen, to summarize, this rather unique and scarce hammer was found in the vehicle of someone whose girlfriend had been insulted by a hammer of that kind. In a vehicle of someone whose fingerprint places him at the scene of the crime. Forensic tests found extremely high likelihood of blood on the hammer. And forensic tests with the hammer showed that both sides of the hammer could have made the wounds on Inga's skull, and a concentration of repeated blows of a small area could have made the large comminuted fractures on Inga's skull. An imprint of that style of hammer was found on a towel at the crime scene. The defense countered by inflaming the judge against Captain Maritz and presented far-fetched scientifically impossible theories to defend obvious mistakes in the autopsy report. The judge rejected Moretz's work, considering his work as well as him as a person as unreliable, whereas he accepted the testimony of Professor Simon, who did not do anything, not a single test, and the judge held him in very high regard. So I leave you with this question. Was the judge correct to conclude with 100% certainty that the hammer could not have been a murder weapon? So that's it for part two, episode 10, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Fortunately, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last video in the in this series. I'm not going to make any more videos about this case. I believe that the 10 episodes I brought to you contains everything that you need to know what happened that day and how the court was deceived and lied to by the defense and how the court accepted lies as truths. I encourage you to go to our website, truthforinga.com, to read there about how the judge accepted Roger Dixon's Section 212 affidavit, which he should not have done, which was a huge error. Read our books. Watch these videos, spread the word. The more and more people become aware of the truth, the more we honor Inge, because the truth needs to be known. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for all your time, for the time that you spent with me. I appreciate it. Bye.